time to give my own presentation and I have a longer and a shorter version. I will uh, give you the shorter version of it and it is different because it's about biosecurity. Uh, biosecurity, I'm giving uh, sometimes a workshop and this uh, biosecurity workshop is about the uh, management of the biosecurity threats. I already indicated in my presentation yesterday and also in the presentation the day before yesterday, my workshop on the uh, Ebola, that uh, the microbiology work also has a lot of internal threats which could be used and misused. And misuse of chemicals is already known and controlled by the UN, by the OPCW, the Organization of Proliferation of Chemical Weapons. It's about especially on the toxicology, industrial agents, and yeah, uh, all the chemical weapons which were used in the past, they have to be destroyed. We have also a biological and toxin weapon convention, BTWC, but this is not really organized. It has in New York, in the UN offices, a department, but the pharmaceutical industry is somewhat reluctant to have all the controls as they have now in the chemical industry. So we need also some code of conduct, how we behave with uh, biological experiments which could be mis misused because there are a lot of toxic compounds in the world. Even kitchen salt is toxic, but you need a very high dose. Mustard, one of the uh, well-known uh, war agents, is toxic, but not as toxic as you perhaps think, because sarin, uh, ricin, coming from plants, a toxin from plants, is far more toxic. It has a lethal dose, which is far lower. Tetanus, well-known. Botulinum, perhaps you know it from the wrinkles. It is the first toxin having an FDA approval, and it is one of the most toxic uh, products we have in the world. So there you already see that the biologic, uh, biologics and toxin weapon convention is very uh, difficult to imply, to get it. It is uh, approved for treating, but mostly the use is off-label. And this is one of the aspects. We know these biological toxins, but uh, for a long time they were neglected. Only after 2001, when we had also the attack on the World Trade Center in New York, the, the FBI reported for the first time over 100 bioterror threats. And that could be poisoning of uh, food, that could be uh, uh, a try to poison water or whatever with b microorganisms. And then we got in also in the Dutch Gezondheidsraad, Health Authority, uh, procedures how to uh, cope with uh, biological terrors. And bioterror after September 11 really got attention. It was, as I already mentioned yesterday, only four deaths directly from the powder letters uh, sent with anthrax uh, spores because this one in Florida might be a natural case, but it gave a lot of intention all over the world. It was really panic. And I already indicated yesterday, but I would like to repeat for those who were not there yesterday, that it is relative. Yes, it is very serious that there were victims of these powder letters, but fortunately it could be treated but a lot of people took the uh, Cypro, the uh, antibiotics, without really need. And then the panic was over, they stopped. So uh, there was a lot of misuse, in fact, of the antibiotics, and it caused a lot of resistance. And even there are some thoughts, and I support those, that there might be more victims from the misuse of the Cypro after this attack than directly from the attack. And relatively, because in the Netherlands two years earlier, we had an outbreak of Legionella's, which was an accident, 
where the death rate was over 10%. In the US, they have some pathogens where they have given the priority uh, to have attention on potential misuse. Anthrax, botulism, plague, smallpox, tularema, and the viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, which I discussed the day before yesterday. And in this, there's a lot of money involved, but on the other hand, it is a one-time investment. So the industry uh, approach to uh, cope with these uh, threats is limited. And it is also limited because there is an involvement of the authorities. Uh, with these dangerous microorganisms, of course we have to take care about biosafety. And we have natural outbreaks of very infectious diseases like Ebola. And in this, we should create more awareness. On the other hand, awareness is good, but awareness can also lead to liberate misuse. And when we have negligence for that, then you can have man-made outbreaks and man-made disasters with biological materials or microorganisms. So we have to be very clear on biosecurity and biosafety. These are the official, official uh, definitions, but I think it's si simply to, uh, to remember biosafety is to keep the bad bugs from people, to clothe you, to protect you, and biosecurity is to keep the bad people from the dangerous bugs. And it is not new to use biological substances as a weapon. Already in the 1700s, it was used in the French and Indian War, where smallpox or chickenpox, it's not clear what was used, in blankets was given to the Indians, and these gave uh, deadly epidemics to the Indian uh, population, so the farmers which came to the U.S., to the Amer North Americas, I should say at that moment, died and they could use the land. Yeah, yeah. a bad use of microorganisms. And nowadays it is still a threat and the U.S. has already selected 15 uh, microorganisms which they consider as a potential biological threat. In Europe they are going further, they have selected 96 microorganisms, which is called in the UA European Union the so-called list uh, 428 to from 2009. What the Europe did not, but what America did, the US did, is also to define some experiments of concern. I already highlighted this the day before yesterday, but I didn't mention it. I'm now doing it. These are the uh, microorganisms which are, yeah, could be uh, misused, uh, toxin producing uh, strains, uh, Marburg virus, which is similar to uh, Ebola virus, which is over here, uh, Bacillus of anthracis, of course, and other uh, microorganisms which could be misused. These are the experiments of concern, and those are mostly on uh, enhancing the harmful consequences of agents or toxins, uh, to disrupt the immunity or, or the effectiveness of the immunization, so to change the uh, uh, pathogen in such a way that the therapy is more difficult, and the toxin resistance. Also to increase the stability, transmission uh, is one of the experiments of concern, and I will come back to that uh, in a slide uh, further. Um, the uh, tropism, uh, susceptibility, and uh, how you can irradiate it. So when you make it more rigid, it is also one experiment of concern. Ebola I already mentioned, but there are all the potential hundreds of uh, microorganisms which could be misused. And they are likely to misuse when they are better available, they are easier to produce, they are lethal, they have high stability, and the infectivity is fast. But it is my strong opinion to make these things secret does not give security. We are in an open society, and in science we should not limit ourselves in communication of 
dangerous pathogen. And also this would hinder, this would, uh, yeah, yes, it would hinder. Uh, it would disrupt the, uh, evil, uh, the uh, continuousness in uh, the research in having better therapies against uh, illnesses caused, caused by microorganisms. And also when we look at the toxins, they are all over the world in the internet. When we have this from the 80s, the uh, Maxwell Hutchinson cookbook with the, the poisonous handbook, it was from the anarchist, but it, you can find the same chapters in the Al-Qaeda manual. And so it happens, and it has happened in the world. This was in Paris, where the police found uh, production of ricin, and ricin has been misused. Even President Obama got once a letter which contained ricin. And there we have fully the dual use dilemma because the ricin is also used in cancer therapy. The ricin toxin is combined with an immunoglobulin which is targeted at a cancer uh, cell and it kills in fact the cancer cell specifically. So it has a potential for de developing novel detection, novel vaccines, drugs, everything but it could be misused as a biological weapon. Who is the owner of this problem? In an institute or in a university or in an industry? Well, I think one person should be responsible for this complete pro management process. And this assessment, what could happen, must be updated continuously. And it has to be communicated. And still, when this is in place, you can have unforeseen experiments of concern. In Rotterdam, at the university, the group of Professor Fouché uh, did some experiments, uh, scientific experiments, to look how they could uh, make uh, a disease, a uh, virus in this case, bird flu virus, from only infected by touching to airborne. And they managed in it because they changed some genes. Also other groups uh, were busy with that uh, from EMI in the US. And uh, well, these experiments were considered as experiments of concern and there was a huge delay in the publication. Fortunately, it is published because this knowledge is re really important to get scientific feeling how we can uh, limit the spreading of uh, diseases it by, by these uh, uh, bugs which could create an epidemic. But there was some concerns in the security authorities about dual use. Okay, just a second time, it's okay. Um, the American uh, National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity has a description for that. And that is, you can read it yourself, research that based on current understanding can be reasonably anticipated to provide knowledge products or technologies that could be directly misapplied by others to pose a threat to public health, agriculture, plants, animals, the environment, or material. So bioterror is not only on humans, it can be also on animals, like uh, food and mouth disease on cattle, uh, on plants, you can infect rice fields and you get uh, uh, lack of food for a certain region. So also this should be considered. And the dual use research, and you can read it yourself, one based on current information that you could imagine that it could be misused, uh, it could be a, a threat, and all these things should be considered. And in my workshop, I have more examples of this. And then we conclude that we need a code. And then we can have a choice for three. One, an aspirational code, a code of ethics. It's just to have an alert, uh, idealistic standards. But we can also give more education. I already have the workshop, so I'm well in favor of this one. And have advisory codes, a code of conduct, to provide guidelines which are written down and I can provide you the Dutch guidelines in English 
for the Dutch National uh, uh, Institute uh, of the Royal Dutch National Institute of uh, Science. Uh, they uh, have debate and you have groups discussing what could be dangerous and what not. And of course you could enforce code, but this doesn't work. This will limit because then you have a code of practice to prescribe that you are allowed to do, you are not allowed to do this, and then we are doing it underground. So that wouldn't work. I'm really in favor to have a code of conduct in this. It is already required, but it was not never implied, imp implemented uh, by the uh, Biological and Toxic Weapon Convention in 1972. In 2005, the Inter-Academic panel, they really came with something which was could be used. And uh, they had a statement on biosecurity, which is respected by a lot of international universities. And this aim of this code of conduct is to prevent life sciences, research, or its application from directly or indirect contributing to the development, production, or stockpiling of biological weapons or biological threat as described in the Biological and Toxic Weapon Convention. And that's the one from 1972. The target group for these uh, uh, code of conduct is the professionals engaged, engaged in it, but doing the research, the organizations which doing the life sciences research, and all organizations around it. But also, look at the bottom line, the authors editors and publishers of the scientific publications and perhaps of congresses who are not uh, uh, closed and they are open and to um, discuss that what is good to discuss in progressing science but do not give those data which might be misused and in a certain way this is really possible. It's always raising awareness. Raising awareness with the, not only at the management of the laboratories but also at the booths. All the technicians should have an awareness about the misuse of the technologies they are using at the booth and have the attention on the theme of biosecurity. Not to to give away something, uh, a strain to somebody who you do not know and from whom you do not know what they are going to do with it. It's the same when you are going to do the uh, care in uh, Africa, in West Africa, on the Ebola. Uh, you are treating patients, you are doing research, you are doing diagnostics, but you are not giving away a, a sample of the Ebola virus to somebody who you do not know and has no academic reputation and happens to come from North Korea, just to mention a country. And so, and also in this, to take whistleblowers seriously. Always, when you get a rumor, pay attention to it when it is in biosecurity. Internal and external communication should be very clear about this. Accessibility you can limit, of course. This is the US MRIT uh, test facility. And yes, that was a place where also the anthrax letter uh, material was uh, coming from. So there was some lessons learned at uh, US MRIT, but you can fence, you can limit uh, the approach to uh, certain departments in the biotech or biological or clinical facilities. A shipment and transport is one of the other aspects uh, uh, that it is well controlled and I fear nowadays the uh, transport is over controlled because it's very difficult to send a sample of a harmless uh, strain of uh, microorganisms to the US because the US authorities, uh, they uh, refuse it. So you have to smuggle it almost uh, to your colleagues in the uh, US to have proper collaboration in science. And um, there are a lot of movements uh, to, to get this more better controlled 
on a more practical way so we can have international collaboration uh, in uh, microbiolo microbiology science. A research and publication policy I already mentioned, it is screening, waiting, and reducing the risk of misuse and to make a scientific article science. And when it is science, the terrorists won't read it. There are ISO standards in risk management, including biological risk management. Um, normally they are implied in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they are not always practical because these ISO standards also give a lot of paperwork. And as a scientist, you do not like paperwork, you li like to do science. And moreover, all the administration takes a lot of time. So a balance in this has to be found and also in the workshop I'm giving, we are looking how to have this on a secure way, well organized and still it, pr it motivates the uh, technicians in the laboratory to do this work. After the um, H5N1 publication about transferring the uh, bird flu um, um, virus from only infective by touching to airborne, uh, we got new laws in the Netherlands, which is in Dutch, besluit strategische goederen. It was seen as a strategic good. And also, to publish this international, it was bound to regulations for export. Well, you have to, s to find something, and there were a lot of new authorities coming. And as a scientist, I'm not very happy with that, because you get when you get more authorities, they all conquer to get more uh, presence and to have more influence, and sometimes these authorities are not hindered by knowledge. And uh, now at this moment, it will be rebalanced in such a way that for scientists, it will be more feasible, more uh, practical to work with. There is a gap between science and security. And this code of conduct is one of those uh, aspects in which we can fill this gap and we can give enough security to the authorities responsible for, se for <coughs> security and enough confidence that there will be no misuse. A national biosecurity center is one of those things which I promote for several countries and this workshop I'm giving also in a lot of African, Asian countries where all these kind of things are under development and I always promote that there should be a national biosecurity center with a scientist, not an administrator, who has a good overview of what could be done in the country and how you can regulate it in a practical, pragmatic way. So international cooperation in science is still possible and the security is under control. Five points of attention. When you are going to do this, think in the good and the bad way. Incorporate the social psychological aspects of potential threat. Calculate risk comparisons. There is not a situation possible without risk. Accept this uncertainty and organize the management of uncertainty risks. So you have also, you need a constant management in the country. Biosecurity, biosafety, and biorisk, those are the three aspects to keep the bad people from bugs, to keep the bad bugs from the people. That is the safety and the probability of change that a particular adverse, adverse event, accidental infection or unauthorized access, loss, theft, misuse, diversion or inter intentional release possibly leading to harm will occur. So this is something which will be controlled by this national center. And this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? I, I, I see this is a different one than the others, but I would like to give this message to you. Thank you. Yes? Thank you very much for your uh, lecture on this highly sensitive area of microbiology, bio-biosecurity. Bio I 
the next day, they hired a field director and hired a third person. I know the other day you said that you wish Ronnie had uh, been out there with us during that time to uh, bring us down here. I'm sure he had a wide crew and this guy was the best. Would you like to know this one a little? Why such a big Australia Rugby League? That's what I find the hardest and that's been done internationally to protect and put some you know. I can do this. Um, there are several organizations which are controlling the uh, bio risk in the world. And we have, um, I will, we have centers of excellence in CBME risk, and that's chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear risk. The European Union has both inside Europe, but also outside Europe, centers of excellence. Uh, outside Europe, I can mention in Moldova, uh, in Nairobi, uh, in Tbilisi in Georgia, uh, in Rabat in Morocco, they have centers of excellence which have a very close uh, communication with the countries around these centers of excellence. So almost all countries are covered by a center of excellence which can advise by this type of uh, courses in biosecurity, also biosafety, and how to, to manage m this risk of biological threats. The US has a lot of efforts in this because they suffered already a, a biological uh, bioterror attack with the anthrax lepers, although it was from inside. Um, and uh, they have the so-called DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And in the DITRA, they have CBEP programs. These are programs to educate other countries. And I know in the Philippines they have a center uh, they have an F all kind of country centers where they educate in biosecurity and how to manage laboratories in such a way that the very dangerous pathogens are contained and cannot be released easily. Uh, this is all outside the UN system. And of course the UN has its biological and toxic uh, um, weapon control system um, to since 1972 uh, convention. It is a convention that is ratified by most countries. There are some countries which are outside the control, and I went mentioned one already in my presentation who had in the past a strong relation with the Soviet system, like in the Novosibirsk uh, lab, uh, the Vector Laboratory, probably you know this Vector Laboratory, very good lab where also uh, one of the strains of smallpox is still uh, available for research. And uh, this center in the past, in the Soviet area, they had uh, relations with the uh, North Korean scientists, and that's why it cannot be excluded. But uh, yeah, uh, that's one of those countries who, uh, which uh, uh, could be a threat because the government has threatened already with these kind of weapons. And so we are prepared for that. I hope this gives you uh, already a, a big uh, uh, answer on your uh, question. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I got your question. Uh, we think, and then I'm talking on behalf of the Dutch Armed Forces and also from the uh, NATO uh, perspective. I'm also a lecturer at the NATO school on this uh, subject. Um, from the NATO perspective, I can say that um, there are no countries identified to be active in biological weapon programs but it cannot be excluded that some terrorist groups are doing it. And the Ayum Sinrikyo was one of those. They were yeah, well known due to the Sarin attack, but they had biological weapons of as well. And it is more that they are targeting against these terrorist groups who potentially could misuse 
biological agents than specifically national country programs. That's what I can say. Are there further questions? No? I must say one of the countries where I'm now um, making such a biosecurity program is Indonesia. And they are really uh, happy uh, to get this organized because Indonesia is a very big country with a lot of uh, public health laboratories and most of these programs are run over public health uh, laboratories because I think that these biosecurity programs is a public health issue and uh, should uh, be run over uh, public health institutes. 